Welcome back. The Canadian military finally has some stability at the top. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau officially named General Wayne Eyre Chief of the Defence Staff. He's been acting in that role since February. Stepping into the role, stepping into that job after Admiral Art McDonald was told he was under investigation for sexual misconduct. Now that investigation resulted in no charges, but it marked the end to the Admiral's tenure in the job. Now General Eyre must tackle some serious challenges. I spoke with him earlier about his plans to do so. General Wayne Eyre, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me today. I, I'm tempted to start with congratulations, but I wonder, given the climate, you're assuming this job full time, whether whether it's the right word, because, you know, you're, you're taking a, uh, the lead here in a challenging time. You've got forces down. There's a reckoning happening with sexual misconduct. How would you describe the state of the Canadian Armed Forces right now as you move into this job full time? Well, to be completely honest, I would assess the state of the Canadian Armed Forces as being fragile. Uh, the pandemic has not been kind to us. Our numbers have gone down. Our operational tempo has uh, increased and uh, the uh, the sexual misconduct crisis that we've uh, uh, we've been experiencing has further uh, uh, hurt morale but that being said we have our members across the world in harm's way uh, continuing to deliver continuing to serve selflessly for canada and, and here at home i am very very proud of the efforts of our members as they face domestic emergencies from coast to coast there's a lot in that answer, and uh, we, I want to touch on a lot of them in turn, but I want to pick up on what you said about morale. Uh, you've been in the forces about three decades, I believe, sir. Is, is this the lowest you can recall morale ever being? Well, closer to four, actually, and uh, it's, it's cyclical. So I saw, I, I've seen the end of the Cold War. I've seen um, uh, the fallout from the Somali inquiry. I've seen the... Uh, um, the fallout from uh, the post 9-11 era that we were in and so lots of changes so yes this is cyclical but in terms of uh, me being in a senior leadership position this is the most challenging you know i have friends in the military i have family in the military but i'm a total outsider when it comes to the canadian armed forces and just looking at it you know from my perch and all the reporting we see about morale and misconduct it looks from the outside, like the culture of the forces is broken, it sounds like it's broken, it feels like it's broken. Is the culture of the CAF broken right now, sir? So let me be very clear on this one. Uh, there are some excellent aspects to the culture in the Canadian Armed Forces. You know, the willingness to put oneself in harm's way to uh, protect others. The uh, selfless service that one undertakes when you go to the other side of the world, leaving one's family behind to serve Canada. The, the willingness to be part of something bigger. We absolutely have to retain that aspect of the culture because it is imperative uh, for operational effectiveness. The, um, the piece of the culture we have to fit, uh, fix is the exclusionary aspects of it. Uh, we no longer recruit from a homogeneous recruiting pool where everybody looks the same, comes from the same backgrounds. We have to be much more inclusive of all segments of Canadian society because as our society changes, as the face of our society changes, we're in a battle for talent. And to be able to attract and retain that talent, we have to um, change the way that we build teams so that every individual feels that they truly belong, can truly contri uh, contribute. They've got that sense of psychological safety uh, where, they, where they belong. Uh, on the day your appointment was announced, uh, Defense Minister Anita Anand said that over the past month since she's been in the job, she's spoken with you quite significantly about her top priority on addressing these cultural concerns. And she certainly left the impression to me that you reassured her that you shared her vision or values on this, or at least you were in lockstep on a plan. I'm wondering if you can share with us what you might have said to Minister Anand that might have given her comfort in this appointment. So, so firstly, that is our top priority, because if we don't get this right, our, our ability to deliver operationally for Canada is going to be compromised. If, um, if we are not able to attract and retain the right talent, we're not going to be able to, uh, to deliver uh, into the future. And so fixing those aspects of the culture absolutely has to be our top priority. So how do you get that right, sir? Concretely, what, what are the first couple of things you can do to start getting that right? Well, I was just about to say there's, oh. there's a lot of work uh, going on behind the scenes in terms of uh, various initiatives. Uh, initiatives uh, to, to uh, improve support to survivors. Uh, initiatives under justice and accountability. Initiatives for culture change. Items such as uh, bringing in a new military ethos uh, uh, trusted to serve that has inclusion as a key aspect of it, a key military value. Um, changing the way or, or building in 
uh, inclusion and how to assess uh, inclusive behavior, bringing that in as part of our assessment system, changing the way that we select uh, leaders, starting right at the top with bringing in more science, uh, psychometric testing, uh, 360 uh, assessment so the subordinates have a voice in the selection of, uh, of, of superiors. Uh, looking at our, uh, our our dress to make sure that uh, that what we have currently based on a, a Western European standard is actually inclusive for all. Um, taking a look at the, uh, uh, the the vast array of supports that are we're bringing in through the uh, Sexual Misconduct Response Center for uh, their support to uh, uh, to survivors of sexual misconduct. Uh, modernizing our military justice system. We've stood up a, um, or the, in the office of the JAG, we've stood up a military justice modernization division to implement uh, the recommendations that have come out of the FISH report. Uh, so, standing up a chief of professional conduct and culture to be a platform to, uh, uh, to implement many of these recommendations, many of these, uh, these initiatives. What, what about, sir, what about more women in the senior ranks of the military? I'm sure you took note when the Deputy Prime Minister has referred to the old boys club in the Canadian Armed Forces just not getting it, and the Prime Minister has said similar things. Do you think you have enough women in the senior ranks of the military in terms of driving that culture change from within? So we have a historical high of the number of uh, 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 female uh, general and flag officers, uh, but we've got to continue to, to ensure that uh, we reflect what, uh, what Canada looks like. But I need to be very clear as well, this is uh, not just a woman's issue, this is a, an issue for the entire Canadian Armed Forces to fix. I, I want to pick up on, on the issue you mentioned of, of people serving overseas, uh, members of the Armed Forces serving overseas, in particular in Ukraine, where we do have forces deployed on a training mission. Uh, I'm sure you're well aware of the reports of Russia massing forces along the border. We've heard from President Zelensky implying there may be a coup attempt with uh, Russian influence there. What happens to the Canadian troops that are there should Russia cross the border? So we've been watching the situation very closely and are, and are very concerned uh, with this behavior, you know, not just on the borders of Ukraine, but we see the weaponization of refugees in, in Belarus. Uh, we see very irresponsible anti-satellite testing that happened last week that has left debris in low Earth orbit that puts satellites at risk for years. And, and so this is all very disconcerting. We're watching this closely. I've been talking to uh, allies. Uh, we're, there, there has to be a diplomatic uh, solution for this. Uh, but the, uh, the force protection of our troops on the ground there is a top priority for us. So does that mean you could send more assets to Ukraine, like a force protection unit which would protect the people we have there? Or could we see combat troops be sent to Ukraine who are prepared to fight should Russia uh, adopt a more uh, hostile posture? So as I, as I mentioned, this requires a diplomatic solution uh, to de-escalate the situation. We've got to be very careful of, of, uh, of um, crossing the line from uh, deterrence into uh, uh, escalation. And, and so this is a tricky situation. Canada's not gonna be able to do anything on its own. This is uh, going to be an allied approach. And again, the diplomats uh, will have the, uh, the lead. But what's the plan there for the people we've already deployed to Ukraine as a country? I mean, do we pull them out, should it escalate? Or do you send in people to, to get their backs? I mean, what would be the decision yeah, there? So I, I, I'm very reluctant to get into uh, operational planning and, uh, and, and some of the uh, um, uh, some of the, uh, the plans that we have uh, going forward, um, but the, the safety of our people is always top in mind. Okay, General Weiner, thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you.